Hi right, friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. One of the cornerstones of every good science fiction franchise is a good old-fashioned planetary invasion. When the day of battle dawns for a besieged world, when the skies fill up with squadrons of fighter craft and the horizon is crammed with starships, we all know that we're in for a good show. Now, these planetary invasions usually don't make any strategic sense and turn into black holes that just suck up assets, money, troops, and all these other kind of things. But where would episode 5 be without the assault on Hoth? What is the UNSC without the thundering landings of the ODSTs? And how could we truly see the guts of the mobile infantry without the Klendathu drop? It's risky, it's costly, full of human drama, and that is why we love it so much. Here are the top 10 planet falls and planetary invasions in science fiction. The Harvesters from Independence Day had an iconic entrance, both wonderfully cinematic and strategically sound. They start off their invasion with an utterly devastating series of blows on every major population center in the world. Their primary city-killing ships were able to get into positions completely unharassed by humanity, and before we knew what was going on, they all delivered their payloads simultaneously. It was a textbook planetary invasion. The aliens clearly knew exactly where and when to attack us. They also knew exactly where our largest concentrations of military power were, and were able to locate it and cripple us before we even had a chance to stage a real fight. And before we knew what was going on, all of our military forces were scattered and in hiding, and the aliens were readying themselves for a planetary invasion so they can mop up the last of our resistance. It was extremely difficult to fight the aliens because their shields were simply impenetrable. Nothing humanity could muster up at the time was capable of getting through them. But luckily, humanity had brains in the form of Jeff Goldblum armed with a soda can, and bronze in the form of Will Smith and his righteous fist of Xeno stomping fury. Only together with their combined superpowers did humanity stand a chance against the aliens. The Xeno's mothership, which was hiding further away from Earth, allowed for the aliens to have an incredible level of response and coordination from every element of their fleet, leading to what was looking like a near-perfect planetary conquest. A hive mind can always give you a huge boost in the madness of war. It lets you to completely reduce the time between order and execution. Unfortunately, it also means putting all of your eggs into one basket, and it allows your heroic protagonist the chance to flip the nuclear kill switch and end it all in one shot. There are plenty of full-scale planet falls and invasions in 40k, but today we've decided to focus on something a little more humble. This won't be a case of millions of drop pods blotting out the sun or large fleets of drop ships landing and disembarking soldiers and war material. Instead, we're going to be looking at a counter-invasion, a supporting action by a handful of space marines on a world already in the middle of a gigantic battle. We would like to use this opportunity to highlight the simple badassness it takes for one man to leap out of their gunship and ride their jump packs down into the heart of a war raging in the skies. Captain Titus was a follower of the same philosophy of orbital entry, first espoused by Master Chief Petty Officer John 117 nearly 39,000 years before. It's a simple philosophy, really, and that its core tenet is the idea that dropships are fun, but you don't gotta ride them all the way to the ground, especially when the amount of fire inside the dropship is more than on the outside of the dropship. Captain Titus built upon this orthodox foundation, adding his own observation that you don't always have to hit the ground immediately. Not if there's something worth killing on the way down. And so the good captain fell with style through a sky filled with shrapnel and weapons fire, and managed to crash onto a ship containing the orc war boss Grimskull. They were several thousands of feet above the surface of the forge world. Captain Titus proceeded to use his own oversized muscles to force that ship to tear itself apart. Technically speaking, the Codex Astartes did not support this action because they could not support the tremendous weight of Captain Titus's adamantium balls. Titus would survive the ensuing crash and go on to secure the Forge world from its innumerable threats, finally killing the war boss as well as countless other orcs, and defeating the forces of chaos, who had been using the confusion of war as usual for their own insidious purposes. Captain Titus proved that a successful planetary invasion doesn't just rely on overwhelming numbers, but can be tipped by just a few key soldiers willing to take bold action. 
This next scenario is less a planet fall and more a planet climb. The Emergence Day invasion was sudden, unexpected, and devastatingly effective. In a single day, the Locust Horde rose up from beneath nearly every major city on Sera, striking simultaneously and using the native hollow creatures of the planet to tunnel through the ground and ferry their troops in massive quantities. In just the first day of E-Day, the Locust managed to wipe out 25% of the human population on Sera. This first strike was so effective it prevented any wild widespread human counterattack for a full year afterwards. The locusts performed amazingly well, especially considering the fact that they were sandwiched between the humans above them and their own infected lambent population below, which they had already been fighting for years. The locusts had no secure home territory left, and they really had no supply chain that could keep them fed and armed for the ensuing battles. Yet they still fought well enough to practically overwhelm humanity on Sarah. Although it should be mentioned that the humans had also been fighting each other for the last 79 years, so they were pretty weakened as well. What really makes his planetary invasion so impressive is that the Locusts had to literally dig through miles of soil and rock to get to their targets. Unlike some of these other examples on this list who just had some atmosphere in their way. Cowards. Given how effective the Locust invasion was, you have to wonder if those chainsaw bayonets also doubled as decent shovels. The two native species on Mon Kella had lived alongside each other for thousands of years in a very careful and stressed out symbiotic relationship. Each society had become closely dependent on the other despite their major differences. The Korans rely on the political clout and charisma of the Mon Calamari in the Galactic Senate to keep their shared world safe, and also maintain proper trade relations. While the Mon Calamari needed the raw materials mined by the Korans in order to build their big shiny spaceships. When the Clone Wars broke out, the CIS saw an opportunity for them to get involved with the local politics, and offered the politically extreme Koran isolation and sleek access to a large aquatic droid army. This made what should have been a small small regional quarrel between the Korns and Mon Cala into something a lot more expansive. The Republic, of course, had to respond and sent their own Liberation Army. The deployment of the clone scuba troopers on this planet was a stunning example of skill and bravery. Riding in LATs with their doors swung wide open low over the waterline, they prepared to jump into the murky depths, not really knowing what exactly was waiting for them in that strange environment below. It takes next level selflessness, dedication, and confidence in one's own ability to just throw themselves into an environment such as this. Our only regret here is they didn't take any cues from the first depiction of the Battle of Moncala. You know, the one where they parked an entire fleet of acclimators directly over the battlefield with retractable diving boards for some really graceful entries into the water. Despite their bravery, the pro-Republic forces had great difficulty during the initial conflict, especially against the CIS-designed aqua droids and giant jellyfish cyborgs. The scuba clones, despite their advanced training, were nowhere near as comfortable underwater as their aquatic enemies were. This put the Republic forces at a constant disadvantage. But the real genius of the Republic strategy was when they finally decided to call some aquatic reinforcements. The Battle of Moncala did what many believed was impossible. It gave the Gungans the potential to be effective in a fight. It makes sense for the Republic to call on the Gungans to fight this battle because why send humans, especially very expensive clone troopers that are well trained for other type of battles, into an aquatic environment when you have a bunch of disposable frog-like aliens? They might have won the actual battle if they had sent their comic relief frogs in first to absorb the first few volleys of missiles and laser fire, and then use the clones and Jedi to take out the more important targets later on. A lot more human lives could have been saved, it would have been the humane thing to do. And ultimately, the heavy Gungan casualties would allow the Naboo to retake their world from the Xenos. It's a win-win for all humans involved. Sometimes a thirst for adrenaline and excitement is so big that even dropping onto a planet in a rocket-powered metal coffin from high orbit just isn't enough to state it. And so for those of you who can't get off on orbital drops, the next best step is launching yourself from one planet to another planet. This is the scenario we faced when we were first shown the Martian invasion of Earth back in 1953. Shooting your invasion forces at Earth from Mars really is the true embodiment of what it means to be a dropper. Sorry, ODSTs, but the speeds are not even comparable. Now, the Martian forces in this invasion scenario oftentimes did land in low priority areas, but that's what happens when you launch something at tens of thousands of miles per hour at a target 89 million kilometers away. 
but the randomness of these Martian landings also made it a ridiculously effective method of shock and awe. When the tripods emerged, they were juggernauts, standing taller and more imposing than even Imperial AT-ATs. They were also completely impervious to conventional human weapons and made our military look like a joke. Although their vehicles were mostly invulnerable, there were still a few weak spots here and there. No alien should ever underestimate the power of Tom Cruise with a bandolier of grenades. Like in all the best planetary invasions, the Martians paired theirs with a terraforming effort to shift the environment of Earth itself to ensure that they could live on our planet comfortably. Luckily for us, our close proximity to domesticated animals, particularly in Asian wet markets, had created tons of crazy diseases that ripped right through the alien invaders because they forgot to cover their faces and maintain proper social distancing. So there you have it guys, five very different planetary invasions that are awesome for five different reasons. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.